We are getting things started the right way this morning with a lot of really hot coffee. Tell you what, it's not fun getting out of a, a nice warm bed in the middle of winter. But these are the things we endure for the sake of getting a nice early start and getting some hunting done. So fingers crossed that it's worth it. What was supposed to be a slow, relaxing start to the day was brought to life as I heard baboons barking in the mountains above us and in a frenzy started rummaging around for a rifle. Please don't have gone. Okay, there's one. We spotted a couple of baboons on the cliff. I think they actually might be sleeping there. But they're 485 meters. I've only got the 22 to 50 because I left the other rifles at the farmhouse in the safe. We're going to go 485. Make it no wind for now. Slope angle. 20 degrees, I'd say. And we're going to go weather 10 degrees Celsius. And we're going to select the 22 to 50. Okay, so we're going to go 2 mils. If you look closely here, you'll see the furry black lumps spread across the cliff. These are all baboons, and I picked the biggest one, hoping my bullet flies true. You ready? Ready. Make sure I'm recording here. Make sure I'm nicely in focus. There was no perceivable wind whatsoever at my position, so I hold dead on, and this is unfortunately the weakness of the tiny 50 grand VMAX, as the slightest breeze up in the mountains is just enough to push it off his shoulder. Ah oh, man, I, I don't know if I hit that one or not, but I have a feeling I missed it, we'll have to check the footage. Not an easy shot, I mean it's a pretty steep angle, I'm having to sit and shoot off a bag, and 485 is pretty far for the little 22 250 with those light vomiting bullets. Man, I wish I'd had my 260. If I had my 260 it would have been a chip shot I think. But baboons have just run off. We know where they sleep now though, so maybe tomorrow morning early or late evening we can have a shot, see what happens. As we finish up our now lukewarm coffee, we quickly realized why the baboons had chosen such a crazy place to sleep. Firstly, it was the very first spot to be hit by the morning sun. It can get pretty chilly up here with temperatures dropping well below freezing in the winter, so sun is a good thing. Secondly though, there are plenty of leopards in the area and I suspect that the baboons probably don't want to be picked off one by one in the middle of the night. Sleeping on a cliff probably keeps them safe from predators. Talking about the sun though, we were in for a real treat today, as it seemed like we'd be in for some perfect weather. With everything packed up and ready to go, we made a beeline for the farmhouse where we'd be picking up Yaku before heading out to find some monkeys. We also needed to free up some space in the back seat to take the extra passengers, so a reshuffle was in order. This is the Dreamline, you can get a, like a 23 grain slug at like 9, 20 feet per second, it's pretty good. But with a 21 grain, you can go even faster. Do and it's just... I couldn't resist taking a pot shot at a rock pigeon 129 meters away as a quick zero check. I'm really enjoying this <laughs> recon tripod for shots like this. Nailed it. A little bit high I think, but I think I just nicked it, but he went down 129 meters. So that's a good uh, confirmation of zero if ever there was one. Aha, it's monkey o'clock. The time of the morning where the monkeys all climb up into the tops of the bushes to find sun and become ultra visible. I know monkey hunting sounds bizarre if you aren't used to it, but monkey control is both necessary and entirely legal in South Africa. So we are not only within our rights to shoot monkeys here, but we're also doing the farmer a huge favor. Monkey o'clock always delivers, and we get started with a thump early on as this guy gets a 40 grand javelin to the head. <laughs> Solid. Perfect. 
You can now see how this monkey is trying to soak in the sunlight here. I like to say that every monkey has a silver lining. Yes, they are a nuisance, but hey, at least we're allowed to shoot them. So we got a nice shot with a with the big impact with the 40 grains on a monkey. I don't I don't even know the distance. We just aimed and shot. But there's some more here. So we're going to walk around with a shorter one. This is just a much better setup for walking and stalking. And see if we can get a few more. Should be interesting. There are so many monkeys here, but the thick bush doesn't really make things easy for us at all. The acacia thorn bush is like a web of protection for the monkeys and we have to position ourselves quite carefully to get a clear shot. With these twigs in front of the monkey's face, I didn't want to risk a deflection, so I aim for the chest and neck area, and the 26 grand javelin does the rest. Finding the monkeys is not the difficult part. They are everywhere. It's trying to get them to keep still that's the hard part. It's a little frustrating watching all of them run past and knowing that there's not much to do about it, but patience is key and we move along trying to find them again. There's quite a good network of roads through the section of bush which was very helpful. Without this path there was really no way that we'd been able to move around like this. When a 22 cal slug connects with a monkey it normally switches them off straight away but this monkey right here had a very busy guardian angel as I just kept having my shots deflected off the twigs. I think it took me three shots before I finally connected cleanly. There you go. Finally. Did you get him? That's the one problem with these 26 grain slugs or any lighter slugs is that, or any pellets for that matter, you just have to hit a little twig and they just veer off. I think I took two or three shots there and the monkey was behind the branches. Just nicked a branch and obviously ricocheted off. But eventually he gave me a just enough space, pull the trigger and you're down. But we might, for shots like that, might switch back to the other impact because those 40 grainers will kind of cut through the vegetation much better. We've started the day off with a real bang, but we decided to move to a different spot. The entire valley floor is covered with acacia thorn trees which the monkeys love, so we know it's only a matter of time before we stumble upon another troop. <laughs> Perfect. Yo, he's just hanging there. Might fall now. There he goes. <laughs> Second monkey down, this time with a little uh, shorter impact, but let me tell you something, this thing packs a punch. It's shooting the same speed as those 40 grains, it's shooting a, a 26 grain at 1025 feet per second, which is like within 10 feet per second of the other gun. And you can hear those 26 grain slugs, they hit hard. They really do. So it's perfect, perfect gun for, you know, situations like this where you need something short and maneuverable and it hit like a hammer. We've had a good run with the compact impact shooting the lighter slugs, but I switch back to the 40 grand cannon once again, and I don't regret it. Two more down, and I tell you what, this gun does not play games. <laughs> That's, it hits so hard. Awesome stuff. I hit this monkey a little bit lower than I wanted and I had to put in a follow-up shot. Thankfully with minimal wind I could place the second shot exactly where I wanted it and it does the job. Dead. Whew. 136 meters. Is that another one on the right there? 
roasting on the tree branch. Yeah, no, that's a tree branch. <laughs> The bush can be quite deceiving. This shot looks relatively clear but because it's so far, the slug has to loop in and just gets deflected off a branch above the monkey. Sometimes it's also hard to get an accurate range. This shot passes just low and it's very possible that the monkey was actually a few meters behind the bushes that I was getting a range off. Even with the misses though, it's been a brilliant morning. With monkey o'clock coming to an end, we decide that a change of scenery is necessary as we head out of the valley floor and towards the mountains. The monkeys tend to prefer the flat areas, but the mountains provide an opportunity to go after a different species, one that the local farm workers eat like chicken or beef, the rock hyrax, or as it's called locally, the dussy. We park off next to some rock structures and begin to glass around. Dassies are animals that also like to lie in the sun, and we spot this pair around 100 meters away, sunning themselves in plain sight. <sighs> Missed. Don't know where. <laughs> Man, I just missed that dassie over the top from about 100 meters. I think that's one of the frustrations with um, with such a high power air rifle is that it's, it can be quite hold sensitive. I know it sounds silly because you, you have firearms that are way more powerful than this um, that I don't say the same thing about. But with an air rifle like this, because it's such a slow push and such a long barrel, the time that the slug is in the barrel, this is a 31 inch barrel, it's 800 millimeters, it's a long barrel. So if there's any slight movement while that slug's in the barrel, it throws your shot off. And I think what happened there is because I'm I'm resting like this at, on the center of gravity, there's that slow push that kind of um, pushes, tilts it up. And I think I just missed over the top because of that. It's one of the reasons I actually used a muzzle brake at, at RMAC. That muzzle brake just stops that, that kind of slow push and just keeps the gun in one position with no movement. Um, but obviously we don't want to be hunting with a muzzle brake. It's, it's unnecessary noise. So it's one of those things I just have to think about and take into account but very, very close, and yeah, it's a pity I missed that one. Cool. With the day drawing on, we decide to head back to the farmhouse for a quick cup of coffee and to plan the rest of the day. We decided that after our coffee break, Nicole and I would head deep into the mountains and try to get a couple dassies down. Monkey hunting is very fun, but there's something so rewarding about dassie hunting. Maybe it's the terrain that they live in, maybe it's the patience required to shoot them, but we really wanted to give it a shot. Like All can, the farm workers, they always ask me for dasis and keys yeah. and stuff. Like, yeah, the really farm like, workers love them, yeah. One day I want to do it like a poiki with a dasi, because I yeah. feel like a poiki, oh, okay. is, uh, you'll, mm. you'll probably, you can make it taste nice, you yeah. know. Dassies live in rock structures where they can hide deep inside holes out of reach of predators like leopards and birds of prey. They're very alert and very well camouflaged and this makes them a real challenge to hunt, especially with an air gun. Patience is definitely required and that's one of the things that I really enjoy about dassie hunting. There's a lot of suspense involved. I finally get an opportunity but I'm beaten by the wind here. Even these heavy slugs are affected in some way. There's no magic formula to escape that. So as you can tell by the, my built-in wind indicator, AKA my hair, <laughs> the wind is picking up now. And something that has to be taken into account when shooting, especially with, with air rifles, but with any gun actually, is wind gradient. What wind gradient basically means is that the wind um, where you are at ground level is always gonna be moving slower than the wind at higher altitude above the ground just because of the way the, the ground sort of creates a bit more drag and slows the wind down. So when we're shooting at an angle like this, I was shooting, I don't know, 120, 130 meters, something like that. I'm shooting up towards a cliff and 
you know that that slug is probably 40 50 meters uh above the ground at some point where the wind is pushing a bit more so i held a little bit for the wind on that shot but the the wind must have been pushing quite a bit more i, I checked my point of impact now it's about a mil to the right which is quite a lot so it's just something we have to take into account we have to be more careful with stuff like that in the future and with this wind picking up we'll probably try to keep our shots a little bit closer just for the sake of trying to get uh, reliable ethical kills but plenty of spots here for Dussy, so let's keep moving hopefully we can get one down and yeah if we can retrieve one definitely going into the pot tonight be good to cook one up <laughs> Perfect. Dussy down. <laughs> held a bit for the wind there. Um, it wasn't as far as the previous shot that I missed, but I held a bit for the wind and he went straight down on the spot. So very happy with that. 40 grand slug doing the job. I had to dial 0.7 mils for elevation. And the nice thing about this, um, this range find is it does take the incline angle into account as well. So unlike using turret tape, if you're using turret tape, <laughs> which is set up for, let's say shooting flat, and then you're suddenly shooting at steep angles, your turret tape becomes completely useless. So having a, a, some sort of on-the-spot ballistic solution that can take real-time conditions into account is, is very important. And in this case, I uh, absolutely nailed it. Once again, I don't think we're going to be able to fetch that one. He's very high up there. And I'm not going to take the risk out here where there's no signal. Um, but yeah, eventually we'll, we'll get a few to take home. Um, yeah, it's been a been a good time out here, but once again, still plenty more rocks to look at. So we'll keep going. Our patience is really tested as we spend an extended amount of time in silence, looking for movement and come up empty handed. So time to head deeper into the valley. There are so many rock structures all around us that seem to be perfect for dozies and eventually we find what we're looking for and man was this shot worth the wait goodness me <laughs> Satisfied with our dusty hunt, we drive as far as we can up the valley in search of a good picnic spot for lunch. We can only drive so far before the road vanishes and the cliffs close in from all sides creating a really steep gorge and as I fly the drone through here, I can't help but wonder how many people have actually set foot in this gorge before. Probably very few if not none. I wonder how many leopards there are down there though. So lunch today is going to be very, very simple. We've got some drinking yogurt and some knickknacks or cheese knacks or whatever they're called. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so no sort of cooking necessary, none of that. We have a pretty big dinner planned, which you'll see a bit later. But we pulled off in the most magnificent spot for lunch. We're literally surrounded by massive cliffs on all sides. Um, yeah, we've, we've traveled very far up this, this, this cliff where we camped last night and where we just managed to get a dusty now basically all the way to, to where the road ends and this place is insane flew the drone down here this cliff just carries on for ages and if you were to put a backpack on and head up here you'd probably see some really incredible sights but yeah we're probably going to camp somewhere around here tonight 
just so that we've got these insane views all around us uh, this evening while we cooking our dinner and, and tomorrow morning. And yeah, the drive between here and the farmhouse provides us plenty of opportunities to get dassies as well. So it's uh, it's worth the, the time it takes to get all the way in here. But yep, lunch is almost over and we'll hop back in the truck, head back to the house and maybe do an, an evening session looking for some monkeys again. So we'll see how that goes. Back on the cultivated part of the farm, the 22-250 comes back out as we are asked to sort out a couple of crows on the lands. The 22-250 is the perfect tool for the job, with minimal recoil and a highly frangible bullet, perfect for varminting and pest control. Yaku takes us towards a cornfield and shows us just how badly the monkeys and baboons have stripped the outer rows of corn. At first, I assumed that the scarecrows were for well, for crows, but I'm told that they're actually for the monkeys. Although, based on the fact that the monkeys were literally just sitting and watching us from the surrounding trees, the scarecrows probably have limited effectiveness. Got that one. I hit this monkey pretty hard here. Yeah? right in the chest of the 22-250 and funnily enough I don't even see an exit wound so I don't know if I just nicked him or whether the bullet just shattered but I've noticed this we saw another few monkeys uh, dead monkeys hanging up there are there this I see two there did you yeah. shoot quite a few here yeah I shoot I shoot me and my brother shoot a lot um, uh, as you can see here there's no no millies left on the outside of this whole land sure just the monkeys and the baboons demolishing everything so yeah we need to shoot them. Yeah. This rifle has been such a workhorse for me over the years. I've had it in this configuration for quite a while with the GRS stock, the Fry and Devic silencer, and shooting 50 grand VMAXs. But I have to say, I'm really enjoying the little 4 to 16 Helix first focal plane on top with a clean reticle. It's just nice and light and matches the rifle really well. But we're just getting started with this rifle, and an evening drive for monkeys is about to prove very fruitful. We park off on a hill overlooking the valley floor below and get a really good elevated view of the bushes. The perfect vantage point for spotting monkeys. Monkeys normally catch the sunlight really well and are easy to spot, but you have to be careful because not every grey blob in a bush is a monkey. I don't know if I'm looking at the same thing. I see... Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, that is a monkey. I'll miss the cable if I shoot from here. Going up. I think we got him. <laughs> That's a good way to end the day. Monkey at 100 meters, so easy for this gun. On the way back to the farmhouse, we have another go at the crows on the fields. I miss this crow, but the best part of this clip is the police car just hanging around in the background. Nothing to see here, officer. Right to left, yeah. Ah, just off to the left of him. So we've pulled in at our campsite for tonight, surrounded by mountains once again, with leopard prints coming right past our camp. 
and bones everywhere. So that's, uh, that's gonna keep us nice and awake tonight. And we're gonna need to stay awake for a while because we're gonna start a poiki right now, which is sort of a traditional South African way of cooking that takes many hours. So we're gonna get that going. And while we're doing that, we're also gonna put up the rooftop tent and uh, get the awning out and get some drinks out and just relax. So time lapse is going, sun will set pretty soon. We've got the sun on the mountains behind us. It's gonna be really beautiful. And let's enjoy the evening. I've been waiting a really long time to do this, um, but I've just never really had the, the time and never really planned it. But we're doing something tonight called a poiki. Uh, poiki basically translates to little pot, although there's not such a small pot, but poiki is a very traditional South African meal. Um, it's kind of similar to a lot, a lot of stews in many different cultures, but what makes a poiki uh, a poiki is firstly that it's made in one of these uh, pots with the the lines around it and the three legs and that it's made over a fire or over wood coals so we've got a rocket stove tonight uh, that we're going to cook on which is less traditional most poikis are done straight on top of a fire but the rocket stove just allows us to use little twigs at a time that we can collect from all over here as opposed to putting actual big pieces of wood on the fire it allows us to control the temperature a little bit better and essentially what we're going to do is we're going to start off with some some chopped onions, we're gonna put them in the pot with a bit of oil, we're gonna brown them, we're gonna take the onions out, we're gonna start with some meat, we're gonna stew some meat, get, uh, brown the meat as well, uh, and then we're gonna start adding some water, start adding other ingredients one by one, some potatoes, some uh, mushrooms, some tomato puree, uh, beans, herbs, red wine, another thing that South Africans do very, very well, so this is a a pinotage from the Cape and um, a few other things and then obviously we'll add it add some rice at the end and should be really good so let's get started we've got a few hours ahead of us to get this really where we, where we want it it's gonna take a while but it should be good in the end so while we're waiting for the food to to cook we've got a long time to wait and I thought I'd fill up some of my guns along um, I did bring a, a carbon tank with me but a carbon tank in itself probably wouldn't last this whole trip. So as a backup, I brought a little 12 volt compressor made by Smacko X. I think that's what they're called. Works really well. Um, and I've actually wired it to my, my auxiliary battery. So essentially I've got a whole 12 volt system that the fridge and everything else runs off that's separate to my main battery in the front. It charges the same way that the main battery charges. So whenever the, the ignition is turned on, uh, the alternator charges this uh, rear battery. And if, even if I run this battery flat for whatever reason, uh, the front battery will still work the next morning when I want to start my car. So it's an awesome setup. And I've got a full series about this on my Matt Dubber channel, which you can watch. I'll put a link down below. But essentially, I've wired this compressor up via an Anderson plug to the auxiliary battery, which is very easy to connect and disconnect. And it's as simple as basically tethering the gun to this, uh, making sure the bleed valve is closed, making sure my pressure is set to 300 bar. This is a 300 bar bottle over here. And I can hit start. Well, first I'll turn it on, which will get the, the fan going. And I can hit start. And there you go. Just wait a few minutes. Normally it takes, for the 700cc bottle, to get to 300 bar normally takes about seven or eight minutes. But that's not actually too bad. So pretty impressive this little unit. Cooking a poiki requires patience. It really is a waiting game and you probably need about four to six hours to do it properly. With both the meat and the onions nicely browned, we add everything together with some water and leave it to simmer while slowly adding the rest of the ingredients.
the last bit is the worst because you can smell what you're about to eat but you have to wait for everything to get nice and tender if there's anything that can make you hungry it's waiting on a poiki but eventually the torture comes to an end and we can finally dish up and then i just knock it over right now please don't do that well guys after i think it's almost almost four hours of cooking uh, the poiki is finally done we've been smelling it the whole time and doing a little bit of taste test which i guess is, is cheating but it's just finished now and this is a fantastic way to end off the day nice big scoop full of delicious food onto the rice let's try to get a bit of that juice as well and this is a great way to cap off what has been a fantastic day of vomiting with the air rifles and the 22 to 50 and uh, yeah couldn't wish for a better day honestly it's been fantastic I have to thank um, I have to thank Yaku for just taking his taking time out the day to make sure that we well looked after and that we're happy and yeah it's been fantastic so food in the stomachs and I'm sure we're gonna sleep well tonight